The speaker is uh, from Gilden, who will talk about imaginary programs and three products. All right. Hi. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Yeah, so I'm talking about measure equivalence and read products. Uh, ooh. Uh, and everything I'm saying today is joint work with Robin Tucker Drob. Uh, let's see if I can spell read products right. Uh, Tucker Drob. All right. Um, right. So, as an outline of the talk, I'm just going to say a few words about orbit equivalence and stable orbit equivalence. Uh, define wreath products and make some simple observations and then uh, state our main results and hopefully sketch an outline of the proof. So just to get started, uh, generally I'm going to be interested in, well, for the entire talk, gamma is just going to be a discrete countable group and I'm going to be looking at free PMP actions of this group. Uh, so we say the two actions are orbit equivalent, which I will abbreviate with this notation, OE, to lambda acting on another space, Y nu. Uh, this is if there exists, uh, if there exists a measure isomorphism between the two spaces that sends orbits to orbits, such that phi of gamma dot X is equal to lambda dot phi of X. So Damien talked about this briefly last week. Uh, and in addition, as opposed to just saying when two actions are orbit equivalent, we can define when two groups are actually orbit equivalent. So same notation. If there exists three PMP actions of these groups that are orbit equivalent. Uh, actions gamma acting on X mu, that's orbit equivalent to lambda acting on Y mu. Uh, and as for examples of such things, there's the, the most important one for the purposes of my talk is just uh, the theorem of Ornstein and Weiss that all amenable groups, all infinite amenable groups are orbit equivalent. In fact, all of their actions that are ergodic and free and, P and PMP are all orbit equivalent. Uh, and that's, that's the primary example of these things. So example, infinite amenable groups that I'll be concerned with. And I also want to define stable orbit equivalence. Uh, if you saw Robin's talk yesterday or what Damien described as measure equivalence, this is an equivalent definition, but I don't want to write down that entire definition. So I'll just define stable orbit equivalence. So uh, gamma acting on X mu is SOE, stably orbit equivalence to lambda acting on Y mu. Uh, if there exists now X prime and Y prime positive measure, well, maybe I should be clear about where they're coming from, X prime subset of X and Y prime subset of Y, positive measure subsets, such that, and a measure isomorphism, phi going from X, prime mu prime. So mu prime is just the renormalized measure on uh, coming from the measure on X in the first place. Uh, y prime mu prime that sends orbits to orbits again. Uh, it's just a bit trickier to write down, but it's not, you have to intersect it with X prime. And this has to be equal to lambda dot E of X intersected with Y prime. Uh, I think maybe I need to assume ergodic for this definition, but so all of the actions, I guess, can just be considered ergodic. And similarly, we can define uh, gamma and lambda being stably orbit equivalent groups if they admit stably orbit equivalent actions. And okay, uh, everything that's orbit equivalent is automatically stably orbit equivalent. And the major Primary example of stable orbit equivalence are groups that are finite index subgroups of one another. So examples, uh, commensurable, commens uh, commensurable groups. Well, let's just say uh, lambda finite index subgroup of gamma. Of gamma or 
all finite groups, for example, are stably orbital groups. They're all finite index subgroups of one another. The groups are stable equivalent. Yeah. If, so these two groups are stable over equivalent because they admit an action, an ergodic free PMP action. Each of them admits ergodic free PMP actions, such as if you restrict the measures, uh, restrict the actions to positive measure subsets, those equivalence relations are isomorphic when restricted to those positive. Yeah. Yes. Actions and yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Gamma stable orbit equivalents to lambda. If there exists gamma acting on X mu, uh, stably orbit equivalent to lambda acting on Y mu. Okay, uh, right. So there's my initial set of examples, and I want to talk about brief products today. So let me get to a maybe slightly bigger piece of chalk. Uh, right. These also showed up several times during some of the exercise sessions. I, I don't know which notation this is, but I think it's not the Ukrainian notation, as Tiani mentioned. Uh, I use the group on the left to be the base group. So this is the infinite direct sum of gammas, uh, of, or lambdas, gamma many of them, and gamma is going to act on that group by translation. And it's a natural question to ask, well, if you have two reef product groups, when are they stably orbit equivalent? When are they orbit equivalent? Uh, right. So what can we say about the orbit equivalence classes or the stable orbit equivalence classes of these groups? And so one observation that's not so hard to make is that, I guess, observation is that if lambda one is orbit equivalent to lambda two, then actually lambda one reef gamma is orbit equivalent to lambda two reef gamma for any group gamma that you choose. And how do you do this? Well, if you start with an action of lambda one acting on some standard probability space, you can associate to this action an action of lambda one reef gamma acting on that same, well, not quite the same, on x1 raised to the gamma, mu1 to the gamma. And the way that this acts is, well, we have a gamma coordinate, which is just going to act by the shift. And then there's an infinite direct sum of lambda ones that, well, there's exactly gamma many of them here. There's exactly gamma many coordinates. We just act coordinate wise over here. Uh, the one relevant thing for Later in the talk, it's just going to be that this lambda one is only changing finally many coordinates over here. All right, so there's, our, there's the observation that we can go from an action to an, of the group lambda one to an action of lambda one reef gamma. And so if we have an orbit equivalence, uh, phi over here, we can just apply the same phi in every single coordinate over here. So phi to the gamma is an orbit equivalence. Uh, this is if uh, phi was the orbit equivalence over here between these two groups, uh, between the action of lambda one on some space x one, mu one, and the action of lambda two on some space x two mu two. All right. Uh, questions about that action or otherwise? Let's see. Uh, right. So this establishes right if we. Started with orbit equivalent groups as base groups, we can see that the entire groups have to be orbit equivalent. Um, you can also ask what might happen if you change gamma and replace it by an orbit equivalent group. It turns out that these two groups are still orbit equivalent. Uh, you have to do something a little bit cleverer than, than what's done here. Uh, you have to do a reef product of equivalence relations. I think this was originally defined uh, in a paper of Delabier, Clavisto, Lamotte, and Tessera. Uh, right, but you can do that as well, uh, replace gamma by something uh, orbit equivalent to it. But now you can ask other questions, like what if we replace lambda 1 and lambda 2 by something stably orbit equivalent? Did you say Lamotte? Lamotte. Lamotte. Yeah, 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 I said Lamotte. Okay. Lamotte. Oh, I oh. understand. I don't have good pronunciation. <laughs> I hope I hope I pronounce it right. Uh, 
Okay. All right, fine. Fine. You've been judging me all week. All right. Uh, right, but now, now you can ask, okay, what if we just change this to stable orbit equivalence or something even weaker? And if you try running this exact same argument, well, what happens? This phi to the gamma that you try defining, you have to restrict the positive measure subsets. So you try restricting every single one of these x1s to a positive measure subset, but it's the same positive measure subset everywhere. So you get a measure zero a subset at the end. So just trying to repeat this isn't going to work if you want to replace something with stable orbit equivalents. Uh, right, and so that's that's what I want to say something about. Uh, so what if lambda one is SOE to lambda two in that previous example? Uh, all right. Uh, the particular examples that I've written down for stable orbit equivalents include finite groups. Uh, and there's some motivation from another area, slightly. There are strong analogies between measured group theory and von Neumann algebras. And it's a theorem of Bowen that, well, not just stable orbit equivalents, but if you, in a very particular situation, look at the wreath product of F2 with a finite group with uh, these are my cyclic groups of size n, but really you can put any finite group there and look at the wreath product with z. Then these two von Neumann algebras that are associated to these groups are isomorphic. And so the analogous, well, what you would hope would be true in measure equivalents is that this same exact thing holds uh, for orbit equivalents, uh, although neither direction is implied by the other. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Yes. Yes, this is Lewis Bowen. Well, I guess there's three, at least three, three or four Bowens now uh, in ergodic theory. Good. You can't just let people be impressed by it. <laughs> you have to be clear. Yeah. Okay. So, what is our result then our result is exactly this um i decided to write it in full generality which may be well we'll see how that goes so the assumptions are let gamma be a group that admits infinite amenable and now i'll hide this in parentheses Measure free factor. So you say so that I'm impressed with what you say. Yes. Uh, let me, uh, so the, the, just doing the stupid thing of taking, uh, like, this, you know, subset of X1 that that's SOE, because that's, that's measure zero. That's measure zero, yeah. That's the problem. That is, that is the main problem, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the main issue. Or maybe not the main issue, but uh, that's, that's the reason why the stupid argument doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, all right, infinite amenable measure free factor. So I guess I can do a pause right here just to say what groups fall into this class, all free groups, surface groups, uh, any, any group of the form amenable free product, anything else falls into this class. Uh, and we assume that lambda one, Lambda two are non-trivial groups, uh, such with well, such that lambda one times z is measure equivalent, or I've been using SOE, so SOE to lambda two times z, or lambda two uh, times z. So, in particular, any pair of groups that are measure equivalent will satisfy this. Well. Okay, so I guess I can write it on the next board. Then lambda one wreath gamma is in fact orbit equivalence, not just stably orbit equivalent, the lambda two wreath gamma. So over here, you might have even expected that if you replace by these finite index things, you might get something finite index at the end. I mean, you get something infinite index, but in fact, you get something where these two are of the same index. They're actually orbit equivalent as opposed to just stably orbit equivalent. 
All right. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this honestly means that the group admits an action uh, whose orbit equivalence relation decomposes as a free product, and one of the components of the free product has infinite well has infinite classes and is amenable. Okay, so it's weaker, definitely weaker than just having an actual free factor. Yes, it's much weaker than having an actual free factor. Right. In particular, surface groups satisfy right. that property while well free uh while surface groups don't satisfy having a free factor. They don't decompose as free products. Okay, so that's the that's the main result. Uh in particular, I guess uh in particular c2 reef f2 is orbit equivalent to z reef f2 uh so giving us the analogy oh i wrote it as cn cn reef f2 is orbit equivalent to z reef f2 so this gives us the analogy with lewis bowen's result uh this orbit equivalence that we construct is actually via the same reef product action that I defined over here. So it's the same exact action that we're actually looking at. It's just constructed in quite a different fashion. Um, Are we using Guy's theorem to say that this uh, lambda cross lambda one cross z, SOE lambda cross z, is a weaker condition than just assuming lambda one is SOE to lambda three. Uh, yes, this is a weaker condition in particular because, yeah, CN and Z. Are not both satisfy this property. You don't need die. Though. You don't need die. That's just. Uh, it's kind of immediate. If you have an OE of action going on, yeah. then you just. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I should mention that there, we do have this assumption on gamma being a group that emits an infinite amenable free factor. While right here, there was no assumption on gamma at all. Like this, this proposition was true without anything. Uh, and, well, we don't have that you can't do better, but at least with the to get a orbit equivalent between the reef product actions, we have a theorem that says it's not possible. Well, for certain types of groups. So, uh, so this is also after draw rule. Uh, so let gamma be so thick, ooh, so thick ICC property T. And assume that the wreath product actions, since let's see, uh, A wreath gamma acting on X1 mu1, well, I guess I can toss in gammas, is stably orbit equivalent. So the weaker condition than orbit equivalent to B wreath gamma acting on X2. To the gamma mu two to the gamma, then actually these two groups had to be of the same cardinality. So here we're allowed to change the cardinality of the group, even to get something infinite cardinality versus cardinality size two. But uh, if you impose some different assumptions on the group gamma, uh, as opposed to being something tree-like, you impose something uh, that has quite a lot of rigidity then you actually get that these two groups had to be of the same cardinality. Okay, I won't, don't want to say too much about this one. I wanna focus more on this side. This one maybe is uh, more of a standard argument following from Popa's co-cycle super rigidity, while this uses some newer ideas. So I wanna focus on those. Yes. Uh, so this is part, the simplicity is used because the way that we differentiate the cardinalities of A and B is by looking at the sophic entropy of the Bernoulli shift, because there's a Bernoulli shift embedded inside here in the way that gamma is acting. So we isolate where that's located and then and compare those two things. Yeah, so if, if Brockman entropy is an invariant, then, uh, then that also will give us this without the sophic assumption. Okay, other questions about the statement? So... Let me say, let's say a few words about the proof. Uh, I'm going to primarily sketch the proof 
in the case where we have like C2 and C3 over here, uh, realistically, that's where that's where most of the interesting ideas come from. Then there's some work that you can do in order to amplify the results to what we have written down in that theorem. But the main ideas are located in this case for C2 F2 being orbit equivalent to C3 wreath F2. Okay, so the idea is going to be is that we start with actions of smaller wreath product groups, particularly in particular ones that are amenable, where we do know a lot of flexibility. And then we're going to try to translate that, that orbit equivalence at the level of those groups into an orbit equivalence at the level of these, uh, of these entire groups. So the first step, it turns out that we don't need to just look at orbit equivalence. We're going to be looking at, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate it first and then describe what, what the object is. So we're going to be looking at actions. So first consider the wreath product actions of C2 wreath Z and C3 wreath Z. Uh, these two groups, well, okay, the wreath product action, I'm not going to write down the measure, but if this acts on two to the Z, and this is acting on three to the Z. If we take the action of C3 on three points and the action of C2 on two points. Uh, right. So a theorem of by of Golovets and Smelschikov and uh, Feldman, Sutherland, Zimmer allows us to say that not only do we have an orbit equivalence between, because both of these groups are amenable. So we definitely have an orbit equivalence between these two actions. But not only do we have an orbit equivalence between these two actions, but actually, if we look at the equivalence relation associated to the entire action of C2 read Z, and there's a sub-equivalence relation of this guy, that's the equivalence relation associated to the infinite direct sum of C2s, that this orbit equivalence that you define phi, well, okay, so there exists a phi that's going from two to the Z, again, with a measure that I'm not writing down, to three to the Z. So not only is this an orbit equivalence between the large equivalence relations, so C3 with Z, but the small equivalence relations inside them, uh, direct sum of C3s over Z. So, the same phi works for both of these orbit equivalences. And this property, okay, it's a property of the inclusion of these two equivalence relations. But for the wreath product actions, this property can be translated to a property that can be checked of the map on the, between the two shifts, just a combinatorial property. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can get a proper piece of chalk this time. Well, all right. So the second step is that this property for wreath product actions is actually equivalent to the property that B is what we call cofinitely equivariant, i.e. if we take two sequences inside two to the Z uh, that differ in finitely many coordinates, uh, finitely many coordinates, then, if we look at phi applied to gamma dot x and gamma applied to phi of, x, uh, phi of y, then these two also differ in finitely many coordinates if these guys are on the side of 3 to z. Again, this is for almost every x, y. Uh, so you can see where the equivariance is. And the cofinite is the fact that both of these equivalence relations that we're checking are cofinite as opposed to just the equality. Uh, this is neither implied by nor implies equ uh, equivariance. So it's, it's a little bit mysterious, but it turns out that just because of the way that these C2s are acting, they're only changing finally many coordinates, that's a, this exactly gets translated to the same property. And the same property, uh, if we replace these Zs by F2s, translates into an orbit equivalence between the appropriate uh, wreath products at the level of C2 wreath F2 and C3 wreath F2. And so step three is just to go from the existence of this cofinally equivariant map between two to the Z and three to the Z to a cofinally equivariant map between two to the F2 and three to the F2. 
And although writing this down is quite, oh, I think I'm out of time. I can write down this picture. Okay. Uh, so although writing it down in terms of symbols is actually quite annoying, writing it down, just drawing a picture is enough to give you, to explain to you why, why you can do this. So step three is uh, uh, describe a cofinitely equivariant map phi, I guess, hat from two to the F2 to three to the F2. And so here's our graph of F2 to some extent. What does this map do? It takes a two coloring of, of a Z line and replaces it with a, ooh, replaces it with a three coloring of a Z line. That's where I want it. Uh, and so we just go ahead and apply that map to every single, every single Z line. So apply phi. So we apply phi to this Z line. We had a coloring, we output a new three coloring. We apply phi to this Z line and so on and so forth with all of these Z lines. We apply phi to them. And the key reason why this ends up still being cofinite equivariant. So of course, this is still cofinite equivariant when you act by an element of A because now you're still just doing the regular Z shift. But when you act by different elements of the group, what's important is really these base points and whether these base points ended up moved by your shift of the group or whether they didn't end up moved by your, by, uh, your shift in the group. And so the important property is that if you look at the set of cosine representatives that I've just singled out and you translate them by any elements of the group, this set is only going to differ, uh, have fin finite symmetric difference with the original set. So that's the key property uh, that ends up being used. And okay, if you check that, then now uh, this B hat is going to be a cofinite equivariant map, which then we translate right back into an orbit equivalence. All right, that's uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you. Let me explain this again. So, like I said, okay, so it's cofinite equivariant Yeah. And then, oh, why is it? But then, then uh, the result is not going to be cofinite equivariant with the origin. Uh, no, not necessarily. So, 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 what's going to happen if you just think about when we're defining this? We do need to pick out a point as the center of Z. Yes. Uh, okay. So what's going to happen when we do a shift? Let's assume that the two sequences are exactly the same in the first place. Okay. Uh, what happens is first we try applying the shift. So this changes our base point somewhere and then we apply the map phi. Most of our base points are still exactly the same base points that we had, but some of our base points have now been altered. Uh, if I have a different color, I can draw a couple of base points that have been moved, but only- Said. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. Gamma is an element of the free group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so some of these got moved. And on these that got moved, this is the same thing as just a Z shift. But there's only finally many coordinates that got moved. So this, as comp compared to doing it the other way around. Yeah. So you don't use almost a bit theorem or something like this? or Not for this. Not for this. Yeah. 